Hello, thanks for joining us on Space Nuts. It's all about astronomy and space science. My name is Andrew Dunkley, your host. And on this week's episode, the James Webb Space Telescope has been hit by a rock. So you shouldn't let kids play near it. That's that's <laughs> the bottom line. NASA has some thoughts on unidentified aerial phenomena. We're going to look at the occultation of Pluto. And there's a fast-growing black hole in our um, neck of the woods. Well, not really our neck of the woods, but, you know, it's in our um, in our galaxy, universe. <laughs> what well, It's in the universe, that's for sure. We're going to find out what it's all about. We'll also answer some questions from Brett about astrophotography and Fenton about the ratios of elements. It woke him up at night and he had to ask. Thanks for that, Fenton. That's all to come on this this episode of Space Nuts. 15 seconds, guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space Nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space Nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. And joining me again is the good Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. Hello, Fred. Hello, Andrew. How are you doing? You're I am well. well. Yes, yes, you are too. Oh, yes. thank you. Uh, <laughs> now, you've just come back from a trip to a little island, which was a former, former penal colony of Australia yeah. called Norfolk Island, which is by sheer coincidence a place that I know well because when I worked for the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, my station was the default satellite feeder to Norfolk Island. So I broadcast to Norfolk Island for 22 years. Well done. <laughs> so about the only place in the world where I'm minusculely famous. <laughs> no, they still remember you, Andrew. We had a conversation about you in a, in a, a wine tasting, actually, in a delightful oh, nice. winery called Two Chimneys, just to put yeah. a plug in for it. Yeah, Norfolk Island, a lovely spot. We were oh. really enchanted with the island itself. All the more so because within two hours of arriving, completely unexpectedly, we ran into somebody I used to work with who I didn't know was at Norfolk Island. Oh, uh, that's yeah. funny. She, 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 she came up to me and said, didn't you used to work for the Square Kilometre Array? And that's kind of nearly true because that's certainly part of what, what we do at the Department of, of Industry. Yeah, so she, yes, I, I, and of course I remembered and uh, we, had a, we had a lovely morning tea, so... Shout out to you, Amber. Thank you very much for that. If you're nice. listening to Space Nuts. <laughs> it's it's a fascinating island, so full of history. Yes, indeed. And, of course, yeah. uh, if you know about the mutiny on the bounty, and, yep. uh, of course, some of our international listeners will be aware of that story, that's where they all ended up. Yeah. And, on, and uh, we Norfolk happened, island. again, completely by chance, Andrew, we happened to be there during the week when they celebrate Bounty Day, which was oh, last wow. Wednesday. Oh, yeah. yeah. So there's, there's a, everybody... The local islanders dress up in 18th century clothes and do a, you know, this kind of reenactment. They they mm. load a boat to, which I think was meant to land on a ramp, but the sea was too rough, so they they sort of hauled it back out with a crane. But yeah, it was it was a delightful experience, lovely thing to see, and yeah. as I said, completely by by chance. And it's uh, it's the it's the place where I caught my only one and only shark when I went. Oh really? Was, yeah, fishing. Mm. Yeah, I caught a caught a bronze whaler. Wasn't a big one, but it was a hungry one. All right. Okay. <laughs> and we had it for dinner. <laughs> yeah, we did. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I have great memories of Norfolk Island on and off the air. Uh, we better get down to business, yeah, we Fred. We've got a lot to talk about. <laughs> First up, let's talk about this situation with the James Webb Space Telescope, which got hit by a rock, only a tiny little rock. But obviously it's, it's something could be very concerning if it causes any damage. But in this case, it doesn't sound like it's uh, going to um, create much of a problem, hopefully. That's right. So, so it's, um, I think that, you know, when you design something like a space telescope of this kind, especially one with such a large mirror collecting area, it's a six and a half metre diameter mirror made of these 18 hexagonal segments. The design itself has got to include uh, catering for the energy that might be imparted by an impacting mic micrometeoroid. Um, mm. And indeed, it's all worked because it was sometime in late May when this event happened. Apparently, it's the fifth time it's been dinged by a micrometeoroid, but this is the, the largest to date, and it was enough to throw one of the mirror segments slightly out of alignment, but, but not anything that couldn't be very quickly recovered. So, you know, they've, they've sort of 
got over it. NASA's quote was after initial assessments, the team found the telescope is still performing at a level that exceeds all mission requirements. So it's uh, it's good. The last thing I heard, and this is a week or so ago, that was that a readjustment was in progress. I haven't heard any bad news that there was you know any serious damage or anything. I think it was just a, a slight knock of the um, you know, slight misalignment, the kind of thing that if it was an earthly telescope, you might do if you walk past it clumsily and your elbow got in the way or something like that. Yeah. So yeah. So it- we're, we're in good shape, I think. That's good to hear. It does suggest, though, that there's a lot more debris out there than you would ever imagine if um, something as small as the James Webb Space Telescope is getting clobbered, you know, a few times. five times. That's right. And I imagine it's going to get hit again at some stage. Yes, it will. I mean, what what will have happened when the telescope was being designed, Andrew, is we've got pretty good estimates of the what I guess will be called the flux level of, of micrometeorite micrometeoroid particles and so the engineers would have built all this in put putting upper you know upper limits i mean if something the size of a potato hit it because the speeds involved are up to 30 kilometers per second i guess that that yeah. could be fatal for one of the segments but i think most of what we're talking about are really micro dust particles that don't carry much energy although they they, they do clearly have some energy <clears throat> because of their velocity. Yeah, they've got momentum for sure. Not not oh. much mass. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's good that it's it's survived and and recovered and when are we going to start it officially in mission mode? It's next month, July. Yeah, I'm not sure of the date. We'll, you know, we'll we'll see plenty of media releases because there'll be some I think quite spectacular images that they will oh. uh, will provide up front. We know it's, yeah, it's working really well, so there's every reason to expect we should see something quite breathtaking. I, I hope so. Can't wait. That'll be big news. All right, from the James Webb Space Telescope to Unidentified Aerial Phenomena. Now, we've been talking about these lately because they, they got to a congressional hearing level. So yes, gov- yes. government officials and uh, Defence Department officials have been discussing these things and they're quite open about the fact that they don't know what they are or who's responsible, whether it's some covert operation by human beings or not, remains to be seen. But NASA has now spoken out about these. Indeed, that's right. In fact, they've done more than spoken out. They're launching a new study. This was an announcement last week. Um, so it's an independent team that's being set up. And, and I think what they're going to do is just assess how much information is publicly available and how much more you might need to understand what these sightings are, are all about. Yeah. So it's, uh, and in fact, that there is a, yeah, of course, there's, there's always a risk when you find NASA investigating what we used to call UFOs and has been usually assigned to the, the sort of fringe activity of, of what you might call the human experience, Pe- people who think we've been visited by UFOs and things like that. So, so that's why I think they, they progressed fairly cautiously with that. So their, their mission science, sorry, it's, it's their science mission chief, a gentleman by the name of Thomas Zabukan, he kind of acknowledged this, that... You know, he says this traditional scientific community might see NASA as kind of selling out by venturing into this topic, but he but he disagreed, and he's quoted as saying, "We're not shying away from reputational risk. Our strong belief is that the biggest challenge of these phenomena is that it's a data poor field." You know, in other so, words, we don't know what they are. We don't know. <laughs> we don't know anything. So the, this is a sort of first step. It's a relatively. What it is, it's pretty inexpensive. It's, I'm going to uh, save that one up because if my yeah. wife says, uh, do you know what this is? I'll say that's a data poor field. A data poor field it is a good one, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so there's an astrophysicist involved and, you know, actually um, David Spogel. He's He says the only preconceived notion going into the study is that the UAPs are likely to have multiple explanations, which I, I think oh. is, is actually one of the conclusions that came, was in that report that came out last year, the, um, you know, the initial report that was publicised by the intelligence agencies in, in the US. Essentially, it's very likely there'd be many different explanations. Uh, so he says, uh, Professor Spergel says, uh, 
we have to approach all these questions with a sense of humility. I spent most of my career as a cosmologist. I can tell you we don't know what makes up 95% of the universe, so there are things we don't understand. Well, that's right. Yeah. You know, this is one of them. So it's not just, you know, it's not, I guess... Uh, of the many things that we don't understand, this is one of the most provocative. Yeah, um, and and the, and the fact that it's been seen multiple times, like hundreds of times, yeah, people have witnessed this, right. these phenomena, and yeah. their speeds and their manoeuvres are beyond anything we're capable of in traditional aircraft. Yeah, I mean, naturally, people are going to default to aliens and UFOs mm. from outer space, but the fact that such big organizations and, and significant uh, people within government and the military are, are speaking out about this says this is serious this is no joke it's not a it's not a um you know someone trying to pull the wool over our eyes and have a bit of fun there's got to be something to it and what I, I think they're trying to do with this study is gather as much data as they can and, and they'll, they'll want to be hearing from anybody and everybody who's witnessed yeah. this because it's been yeah. seen out over the Pacific Ocean mostly by military aircraft but also civilians. So, yeah, they can try and get as much info together and, and study it to see what they can learn and hopefully come up with some kind of theory at the very least. I'd love them to go all the way and say, oh, yeah, we know what it is. It's it's those the guys who just got their driver's licence in California <laughs> and uh, that's, mm. that, that'll be it. <laughs> got a feeling it won't be that. No, but... I don't think it'll be that, but, yeah, yes. You know, one of the theories is that it's another arm of the US government <laughs> which doesn't talk to anybody and wants to keep these things a bit undercover, which if that was the case, why did they fly them next to to US military bases. That's so, right. You know, anyway, look, I think I think it's I think it's a great step actually. I think it's something mm. that is of interest to everybody and we might indeed learn something that um, we didn't already know. Well, if they bring Fox Mulder into it, he'll figure it all out. I'm sure. Very good. Yes. He's always good at that. <laughs> I've just got a text from my wife and she's asked me what this debit is on our back account. I've just replied, hang on. It, that's a data poor field. <laughs> It's gone into an unidentified aerial phenomenon. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Well, obviously there'll be there'll certainly be more to tell about this story going forward. So we'll keep an eye on it, and if they come up with some sort of idea or at least some basic theory, we'll we'll let you know what they think. But at this stage, it's uh, it's all up in the air. Boom, boom. Oh dear, <laughs> that was terrible, Andrew. <laughs> it was horrible, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, we'll take a break. This is <laughs> Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley and Fred Watson. Roger, your lives are here also. Space Nuts. Now, Fred, I don't uh, profess to understand the next story in any way or form. It sounds too complicated for my feeble brain, but um, scientists in Australia are running around the desert looking for Pluto, and it's got something <laughs> to do with occultation. Indeed, it's a really great story, actually, is this. And I think I um, seem to remember hearing some, <clears throat> excuse me, reading some correspondence about it when it was in the planning stage, probably a year ago. Um, so let's just talk about the phenomenon that's, that was being observed. It's an occultation. And, well, occult has a different meaning these days, but the, the word means to occult is to hide. And so that's what it what it's about. So I guess the occult is the hidden. But an occultation is when one body, one celestial body, hides another. And in this, and you can actually use these to learn stuff. Um, so, well, think of it this way. For example, if you have an asteroid, uh, which you only see, excuse me, in a traditional telescope as a point of light. Um, some some asteroids have been mapped by radar, but most of them, all we we know about is their their brightness and their, you know, that gives you an idea of how big they are. If you wanted to sort of map its shape accurately, one thing that you can do is that <clears throat> you can work out when this asteroid might pass between the Earth and another star, a distant star. And what mm. happens in that case is the, the light of the star is blocked out by the asteroid. So you get this shadow of the asteroid in starlight passing over the Earth's surface. Wow. And so traditionally what people have done is strung out observers 
along this path where the shadow is, is going to move and as many observers as you can, both along the, the direction of the path and, a, and at right angles to the path. And then these observers can time accurately when the star disappears and when it reappears. And <clears throat> by doing that, you can actually get a very accurate inf- calculation of the shape of the asteroid. So mm. that's, that's the sort of traditional use of occultations. But here we have something slightly different with the planet, sorry, I beg your pardon, with the dwarf planet, Pluto. <laughs> I've been around for a long time. It, it's, <laughs> 2006 is pretty recent in my understanding, or, knowledge, or friendship with Pluto, let me put it that way. Mm. It is a dwarf planet, though, there's no doubt about that. Anyway, the dwarf planet Pluto is, we know, about a couple of thousand kilometres in diameter. So what's happening is that it will pass in front of a star, And so in this case, the occultation observations are not really so much about the shape of Pluto, because we know that pretty accurately from the New Horizons flyby in 2015, but it's about Pluto's atmosphere, because Pluto has this tenuous atmosphere. And what that means is that when Pluto passes in front of the star, as seen from a vantage point on Earth, the the star's light dims slowly. It doesn't just switch off because it dims as it passes through Pluto's atmosphere. In fact, Ah. some years ago, excuse me, it's probably a decade ago now, I was peripherally involved with exactly similar measurements of Pluto's atmosphere made from the Anglo-Australian telescope when I was astronomer in charge there. Um, And I think they got really good results showing the layering of the, the atmosphere of Pluto. But there is another possibility that comes from this, <clears throat> and this is what makes this story, I think, really exciting. Because if you happen to um, have an observer right in the centre of the track that Pluto is you know, following across the, across the surface of the Earth, <clears throat> there is a chance that you might pick up, as well as seeing the light of the star dimming, as, the, as Pluto passes in front of it, you might mm. pick up a bright flash in the middle where Pluto's atmosphere refracts the light around it and focuses light onto the surface of the Earth. Oh, wow. Uh, so there's the potential for a, for a bright flash. And the reason why we're talking about this story is that they got it. And there's a lovely feature, actually, good plug here for the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, the ABC's website, they have a very nice piece on this, which is done in what they call their Odyssey format, which is a very Mm. image-rich and video-rich format for for websites. If you you look for searching for The Flash, basically abc.net.au, that's the Australian Broadcasting Commission's website. There's a very nice piece done by somebody I'm privileged to know, a science journalist, Michael Slezak, um, uh, and they put it together, and it is a very exciting read. And not only that, but you get the video feed from the flash itself, which is quite an extraordinary thing. This flash of light lasting about a second as the this focused beam from the star passes over the surface of the Earth. It's very, very nicely done. Yeah, it's a great page. I'm just scrolling through it now, and they've got that time-lapse video of the of the people setting the observers, up the observers that's right and, yeah yeah it's really quite an impressive um display of of news actually <laughs> the way they've done it yep. makes me wonder fred um about other shadows that may be hitting earth that yeah. we are totally unaware of we don't, we don't think about that but we must be getting hit by shadows all the time yeah that's right <clears throat> You know, every star in the sky is going to produce shadows of objects at one time or another, but we don't we don't think about them because they're not. The only way you can record them is by having a telescope pointing in the right direction. So yeah. when I was a young astronomer <clears throat> back in the 1970s, Andrew, we I was engaged in occultation observations, not of asteroids or dwarf planets, but of the moon. Stars being blotted out by the moon, particularly near its northern and southern poles, because what happens there is <clears throat> as the moon, if you've got a star that's, you know, that the moon's edge is just going to skim as it mm. passes in front of it, this star will disappear and then appear again, then disappear again and appear again because of the mountains on the moon. So oh, it's actually right. a, way of, a way of 
you know, looking at the topography of the moon was was to do occultation studies. And I remember being quite deeply involved with that in the Sussex countryside from the Royal Greenwich Observatory a long, long time ago. (laughs) Now, just to get back to Pluto for a moment, they got the flash, but I understand they also learned something about Pluto's atmosphere, and that is as it moves further from the sun, it's thinning? I think they got the opposite from that. Oh, the opposite. I remember it. Yeah, because you'd expect it to thin. And, and that oh. was actually one of the reasons why New Horizons was sent when it was in uh, 2006 was when it was launched and made to be a very fast spacecraft. It was to catch up with Pluto before Pluto's eccentric or elongated orbit took it away from the sun because the feeling we've known for a long time Pluto had a thin atmosphere but the expectation was that as Pluto moved away from the sun that atmosphere would just freeze out onto the surface of Pluto because it's so cold but if I'm reading I can't remember I read this last week but I think the uh, there was a comment as though the the atmosphere was actually thickening as it, as they as it moved away from the sun. So that's a really interesting observation, and it highlights Very. the need. You know, the reason why occultation experiments like this are so worthwhile. It's a lot easier to put together forty telescopes in the outback of Australia or where, wherever the shadow is going to pass than to send a spacecraft to Pluto. I was about to say the same thing. It's amazing what we can learn by not leaving the planet. Yes, that's right. If we've yeah. got the right tools and the right yeah. people in the right place. And a lot of ingenuity, yeah. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, that's fascinating. All right. Now, another story we wanted to talk about was this this black hole that's been discovered, and, and this has been described as a fast-growing black hole, and it's seemingly quite hungry. It's also pretty darn big. Yeah. So, yes, it's a, it's a supermassive black hole. The yardstick we use all the time on Space Nuts is the supermassive black hole at the centre of our galaxy, which is 4.1 million times the mass of the sun. This one, which is in deep space, so it's, it's not anywhere near our galaxy, but it is uh, three point, sorry, it's 3 billion times the mass of the sun. Three, bi- 3 billion times the mass of the sun. So it, it's, it's a much bigger black hole. It's a very nice story, again, that... Uh, An Australian story, astronomers at the Australian National University, led by uh, Chris Onken there, used SkyMapper, which is one of the telescopes at Siding Spring Observatory near Coonabarabran, where I used to work. That SkyMapper does what its name suggests. It maps the sky. And the astronomers were actually looking for what are called symbiotic stars, where you've got two stars revolving around their common centre of mass, a binary system, but they're exchanging matter. And that's what they were looking for. But what they found was this distant, very distant object. I think it's, if I remember rightly, it's about 9 billion light years away. It's that sort of distance. We're seeing it at a really quite a large look back time. It's a quasar, and quasars are essentially the supermassive black holes at the centre of galaxies, which are very active in devouring material. And this one's turned out to be a bit of a record breaker. So it consumes the equivalent of one Earth every second, uh, which is, that's quite an accretion rate. And that's probably why it's grown, grown so big. So the record breaker is that it's the fastest growing black hole discovered in the past 9 billion years. So there you go. <laughs> so is it at the centre of its own galaxy or yeah. is this one a free roamer? I think it's odd, isn't it? Because the amount of energy that's coming from the accretion disk around the black hole outshines the whole galaxy. And that was actually what puzzled astronomers when they first discovered these objects, quasars. They were quasar is quasi stellar source. So it looks like a star, but actually it's got a host galaxy. And often the host galaxies were discovered later around this bright point of light, which was the quasar. So this will have a host galaxy probably, but it's the quasar itself that's been observed, the black hole and its accretion disk. Yeah. Wow. Got a great name too, hasn't it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't think we've got time, really, for the no, it's next. so long. long. They're calling it J1144 for short. <laughs> There's a lot more besides those numbers, but, yeah, J1144. Yeah, well, J1144 7.77-4308593. Oh, that's good, all in one breath. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't. I need a break. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it, well, that'll be one to keep an eye on. Yeah, I think so, so yeah. It's a, you might learn a bit more about black yeah. holes because of its sheer enormity, but it's 
It's appetite. It's appetite, that's right. Yeah, quite fascinating. All right. We will take a break, in fact, from Space Nuts, episode 309 with Andrew Dunkley and Professor Fred Watson. Zero G and I feel fine. Space Nuts. Question time, Fred, and maybe gives me an opportunity to remind people that next week it will be episode 310 and uh, we have generally been, and although we've been a bit slack in recent times, generally been doing all question episodes on the 5th and 10th of the rotation. So next week will be an all question episode. So if you do have a question for us, please send it through via our website, spacenutspodcast.com or spacenuts.io. Click on the AMA tab to send us an audio question or the, you know, send us an audio question tab on the right-hand side of the screen and we'll get through as many as we possibly can, including this one, Fred, which comes from Brett. And this this is an area I have an interest in and I, I know a lot of people are astrophotographers and get out in the backyard with their telescopes trying to take fascinating pictures of objects that are close enough to see. Brett from Pennsylvania says, I have a question about professional astrophotography from large observatories. So the way I've been learning to take images is through what's called the prime focus with a DSLR camera or a focal with a cell phone. What type of technique do large telescope observatories use? Is it like prime focus DSLR or with a built-in camera? Thanks for taking the time out of your day for my buffoonery. Love the show. Have a great day or night or whatever whatever it is when you read this. Well, I actually read that at 9.15 Eastern Standard Time yesterday morning. <laughs> Good. So, Brett, thanks for the question. I, yeah, I've never thought about it, but are the techniques used by those big observatories um, similar or the same as the ones like, do, do you strap an SLR camera to the bottom of your <laughs> four-metre telescope or whatever? Look, it is a great question. And there are really strong similarities between what astrophotographers do and what professional observatories do. But I guess the thing to remember is that the the cameras that professional astronomers use, and they're <clears throat> Since the 1980s, they've been CCD cameras, charge a couple devices. And they're the ones that really led to the development of, um, you know, the consumer level cameras. So these were pioneering instruments. And in their most basic form, and this is still what they look like, they consist of a, a chip, a silicon chip, which has the charge, charge wells etched on it, which is usually cooled because if you don't cool them they basically all you get is thermal noise you get the heat noise from the detector so they are placed in a thing called a cryostat and the cryostat is as you might expect from the name something that keeps it cold at a particular temperature the ones i used to use were cooled to about minus 100 degrees celsius Um, and that's so that you can do very long exposures uh, you know, typically you can do 20 minutes, half an hour or something like that before the thermal noise, the, no- the, the noise coming from the just the, the sheer temperature of the thing before that gets gets too excessive. So, yeah, they're cooled. We, we cool them often with liquid nitrogen, but also with what are called cryocoolers. These are like very sophisticated refrigerators. So stepping up to state of the art, today it's the same sort of thing which is essentially a box with a big window on the front and that that box is evacuated. You've got to get all the air out of it because otherwise the air transmits the heat from the outside to the detector and it's impossible to keep it cool. So it's in a vacuum. It's cooled by either liquid nitrogen or, or, uh, as I said, a a cryocooler, something that actually acts like a refrigerator. Um, But often today these things are not just one silicon chip they're a mosaic of silicon chips sometimes with you know more than a hundred individual detectors and so what you do is you build up a mosaic of these device these detectors that um that allow you to to cover a much wider area of the sky so and that is often at prime focus. That means the main focus of the mirror, but sometimes they're used at different foci as well. Often there's a corrector lens in front of them as well. We used to have, when I started this game using CCD detectors, I was doing it, Andrew, for spectroscopy rather than direct imaging. I was putting it at the detector 
behind a spectrograph. So it was recording the spectrum of objects rather than just the individual objects themselves. And we had all kinds of problems with some of the glasses that were used in the correcting lenses were just slightly radioactive. And so they ping out all the subatomic particles, which of course are recorded by the by the detector that's about, you know, five millimeters behind it. And so that was a big problem. We wound up having to use fused quartz, which is, you know, pure, pure silica mm. as, as, uh, as the lens material. Um, there's also one of my favorite stories in the, uh, in, in the story about astronomers' acronyms, because astronomers always think up fancy acronyms for their instruments. I built several with slightly more and more ridiculous names. The first one was Flare, the fiber-linked array image reformatter. Anyway, it, the story goes on. But my favorite of all time is one, one of these mosaic cameras that was being built by a group in the USA. And they were going to call it Mosaic, which was an acronym. And I can't remember what the acronym was for, but they, they was going to be called Mosaic, this instrument. But then they realized that somebody else had an instrument already called Mosaic. So they renamed it TIFCAM which sounds very appropriate because it was a camera. TIFCAM is an acronym for the instrument formerly known as Mosaic, <laughs> which I thought was just brilliant. And so TIFCAM, yeah, became uh, <laughs> a bit of a thing. The One artist these... formerly known as Prince. <laughs> yeah, that's right, yes. Yeah. yeah. That's that's. That's just too good. Yeah, it's a nice one, isn't it? So, yeah, um, yeah so it is similar technology. Just one other thing that detectors that are used in the kind of imaging that professional astronomers use, not colour detectors. That means they're not a mosaic of three colour uh, charge wells, which a commercial one would be. The colour is put in by filters that are, that are put in front of the, of the camera. Uh, there are different ways of doing it. You can you can actually divide the beam up through co different coloured filters. So you've got maybe three three cameras all all recording black and white, but looking through three different coloured filters, which you can then build back to get a true colour image, a real true colour image. Or you can do it mm. successively by having a filter wheel, where you put a different filter in front of the camera and take separate exposures. So in answer to Brett's question about, you know, do you use an SLR camera, that would be a no? It's no, that's right, but it's not that dissimilar, yeah. Okay. What sort of camera would David Malin have used when he, he's famous for his astrophotography? Of course, that's right. Well, he used something called photography. You know, <laughs> he used plates, actually. Oh, plates? Yeah. Wow. Well, we did, you know, photographic plates were the stock in trade of astronomy until actually certainly for large format cameras, and that was what the UK Schmidt Telescope was. We were using them until 2000, in fact. In fact, I think our last exposure, which was probably made on film rather than plate, was 2003. These were 14-inch square glass plates, 356 millimetres or whatever it is, yeah. because you couldn't get electronic detectors of that size. That's why photographic plates were used. So, yes, David's techniques were all perfected. Towards the end of his career, he was using CCD cameras, charge a couple of devices but um, but he retired in 2000 so it was was phot photography was very much what what he did so he was a chemist actually that was his background mm. and it was the chemistry of the photographic process and the idea of using colored filters that um, launched him to fame in the 70s and 80s yeah, yeah. oh look uh, if you've got time to look up david malin's photos on the internet they're all over it because some of them are just famous just you know You'll recognise them as soon as you see yeah, them. Yeah, they were on, oh, wow. on book covers and record covers. Oh. And, and now amateur astronomers can produce the same quality in terms of yes. the colour because of, of all the software, you know, clever software devices. I should well, say... Most can. I'm not one of them. <laughs> David's, I'm still practising. Yeah, David's well. Uh, we catch up usually once a fortnight, once every three weeks oh, because he lives quite close to where, where I live here in northern Sydney. So, yeah, we're, you know, they're often around here and we're often around there. It's uh, very nice to have a friendship with one of the great icons of Australian astronomy. Well, pass him my regards. I he will. doesn't know me from a bar of soap, but do it anyway. I'll tell you about <laughs> uh, Don't you worry. I'll tell him about you, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure you will. I'm sure you will. Yeah, yeah I don't think I like that. Okay, <laughs> now, <laughs> thanks, Brett, for your question. Hopefully that... Um, answers your query. Okay, we checked all four systems and seeing with a go. Space Nuts.
Uh, now, let's move on to an audio question. Fred and I think that this has been a sort of a wake up at two o'clock in the morning. Oh my God, I need to know the answer to this question. <laughs> it's certainly not something that I've puzzled over, but Fenton definitely has. Hi, Fred and Andrew, this is Fenton, and I'm in Minnesota, in other words, in the US on the opposite side of the planet from you. I saw a poster presented by someone at NASA who was talking about the ratio of hydrogen to deuterium as a function of distance from the sun. And it apparently changes. There's a gradient. And I don't even know which way it goes. And so if you could talk about this, maybe explain which way it goes, what the theories are behind it. And if you have time, I would also be curious to know if there are different ratios of other elements as we travel away from the sun. Ah, wow. Okay. Fenton, uh, I don't know. Honestly, we are so surprised by some of the things people <laughs> think of to ask. And that one, I would never have anticipated in my life, the, the ratio of elements as you move away from the, uh, the sun. Of course, the answer is it increases in terms of deuterium and reduces in terms of hydrogen. I thought, you know, I knew that off the top of my head. <laughs> I think that's it's a great, it's a great question. Yeah, really I mean, all the questions are great. <laughs> this one, this one's way out of left field. I was never, I was not ready for it. No, it's absolutely true. So you're quite right, Andrew. The ratio of deuterium to hydrogen increases as you go out through the solar system. It's, it's a. Uh, so I, of course, this sent me to the web to check up on the background of this these observations. So there's there's some. Uh, Results that ESA, European Space Agency, reported at the end of 2014, and um, they come from the Rosetta spacecraft, which um, was capable of observing, well, of course, the uh, comet uh, 67P, uh, Turium of Grasimenko, the one it went in orbit around, but also to look at other, you know, the other uh, work, other sources of our knowledge of what deuterium to hydrogen ratio is. And I'm going to quote, actually, from this ESA article, because that's the easiest way. Otherwise, I'll just, um, I'll just uh, you know, gobbledygook all, all the, the terminology. But it's a, this is just a news report from ESA back in 2014. Um, and it says, the different values of the deuterium to hydrogen ratio in water observed in various bodies in the solar system. That's what they're the result is. Deuterium is an isotope of hydrogen with an added neutron. The ratio of deuterium to hydrogen in water is a key diagnostic to determining where in the solar system an object originated and in what proportion asteroids and or comets contributed to Earth's oceans. And that's why this is such an interesting thing. Mm. Um, so uh, you can't see the diagram, but um, I can tell you the data points are grouped by colour as planets and moons, which are shown in blue, chondritic meteorites from the asteroid belt, which are in grey, uh, comets originating from the Oort cloud, which are in purple, and Jupiter family comets, which are in pink. Rosetta's Jupiter family comet, that's 67P, is highlighted in yellow. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, you can't see any of that. But what it's saying is um, it's showing how, and, and just to describe what this diagram shows, it's a gradual increase from the Earth which has a deuterium to hydrogen ratio of around about uh, 10 to the minus 4. That's one part in, in 10,000. So that's where the Earth is. But as you go further out in the solar system with these various Jupiter family comets and the Oort cloud comets, as well as 67P, you find that the ratio gradually increases. And 67P itself has a ratio of, I would, Reading from the diagram here, it's about, uh, hang on, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, it's it's four times 10 to the minus four. It's rather more than the Earth is. So the difference is not great, but it is there. And that's, I guess that's what it's telling you is the, you know, the, the, um, the fact that the, the ratio of deuterium to hydrogen is higher. The consequence. I'm just going to go back to the uh, to the article. So, so actually, this article is very much along the lines of it's not giving us a, a reason why why 
ratio is higher. What it's just saying is that that's the fact of the solar system, that you've got more deuterium out in the uh, in objects that originated further out in the solar system. And, it, and it's just basically telling you the, the fact that, it, in fact, I'll quote, the discovery fuels the debate on the origin of Earth's oceans and whether asteroids or comets played the bigger role in delivering water. Yeah, so the fact that 67P has more than three times the ratio of deuterium to hydrogen as the Earth's ocean did, uh, that says, well, maybe our water didn't come from comets like Ah. that. But some of the nearer ones have lower deuterium to hydrogen ratios, and that suggests that perhaps they did. So a complex but very interesting question. Uh, Whether other elements are certainly present in different ratios as you go out, uh, you know, you've got far more hydrogen in the gas giants than we have locked up in the earth. So that's the the sort of latter part of uh, of, uh, Fenton's question. Yeah, I suppose it it makes sense that Earth's oceans have less deuterium than some of the objects in the outer solar system because I think you and I discussed not so long ago a study that suggested Earth's water probably came from the rock itself. Yeah, that's right. Which contained water when the planet congealed. Yeah, (laughs) well, that's right. So, yes, so I think the answer is, you know, it's a a mixture. It's uh, some of – there is some – water that's come from comets with a higher deuterium ratio, but there's also a kind of high population of indigenous water that came, as you say, from the rock itself. It was locked up when the solar nebula collapsed and the um, the rocks were formed. It's fantastic stuff. And they've been able to, from that data, prove that the amount of water on Earth is accountable. Yes. Whereas comets yes. alone couldn't yes. have done it. Yes, I think that's right mm. too. Yeah, yeah. You mem- yeah. remembering our stories well, Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you know, when I was at school, all the stuff I remembered never came up in tests. That's no good. <laughs> it's only the stuff I forgot. <laughs> <I> did. <laughs> that's my excuse, and I'm sticking to it. Well, yes. Yeah. Now, a reminder that next week we will do a full question answer show so if you would like to send us a question if you have a data poor field that you would like us to to fill for you send us your questions via the space nuts website spacenutspodcast.com or spacenuts.io you'll end up in the same place either way and you can click on the link on the right hand side of the home page that says send us your voice message or you can click on the ama tab up the top where you can send an audio message or audio question and or a text question. So either way, happy to um, tackle some questions on next week's episode, episode 310. And while you're online, check out all the other stuff that's happening on our our page. You can check out Astronomy Daily, which publishes very regular and up-to-date astronomy news. You can visit the Space Nuts shop. And I just got a message from Hugh to say that Somebody who's listening live today on Facebook has just bought a copy of the Turanian Enigma turned up in the mail. So I will take my 20 cents of commission from that sale and and put it in my piggy bank. Thanks for buying it. I hope you enjoy it. Let me know what you think. I love the feedback. Uh, I'd I'd like to know because Turanian Enigma's got a a couple of massive twists in it. So I, uh, and and so far nobody's written to me and said, oh, yeah, I picked it. (laughs) So... I like to keep them guessing. Keep them guessing. Um, right. But yes, uh, yeah, jump on our website. There's all sorts of things to see and do there. Don't forget the social media as well Space Nuts Facebook page and the Space Nuts podcast group Facebook page where listeners can get together and chat amongst themselves and share their photos and all sorts of things. It's, it's a great little group which I pop in to see occasionally. Fred, that brings us to the end of this episode. Thank you so much. Great pleasure. Always good. Some really interesting stuff. I mean, I learn as much as anybody else does when we do these sessions. It's great. It happens that way sometimes, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't it? it? Good stuff. It, it, it enriches it enriches our data poor field. That's what. Yes, that's what it is. It's all about enrichment. <laughs> Thanks yes. a lot, Andrew. It's another way of saying we've learned something. Yes. All right. We'll catch you next week, Fred. Thank Sounds you. Great. Yeah. Fred Watson, astronomer at large, who helps us out every week here to a minor degree Mm. on the Space Nuts (laughs) podcast. 
And uh, thanks to Hugh in the studio for pushing all the buttons, ringing on the bells and making all the coffee and tea. He drinks it himself because he can't get it to us, but he, he does it anyway. And from me, Andrew Dunkley, thanks so much for your company. Look forward to you uh, joining us again on the very next episode of Space Nuts. Bye. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. And thanks to those who've listened or watched live. We'll see you next week. Take care.